If you haven't done tests like this before, the abstract reasoning section is probably the one that you will find weirdest, and at least to start with, potentially, um, the one that you'll find most challenging. Um, depending on how your brain works, that may not continue to be the case. Some people just get the hang of these things and become quite good and quick at them. Personally, it's absolutely not the way my brain works, and I continue to find this uh, the section I like the least. But, you know, you just have to work on it because you will certainly get better at it the more you practice. So what it means by abstract reasoning is that you're going to have to work with visual um, patterns which have no meaning. So you can't in any at any level sort of understand them, but you're just looking for patterns within these um, visual things that you see. Um, and you're using those patterns to uh, to answer questions. And it really just can seem baffling um, at the start, but you will get there at least to some extent in the end. And again, you have to be very quick um, once you're up to speed with this. So um, to begin with, it's about taking your time, getting used to what kinds of things you should be looking for. Uh, but eventually you need once you feel you've got those basics sorted out, you need to really work hard at doing that quickly. So you get two or three different types of questions. There is only one of those types explored in this particular um, test that, that, that we've been working with here. Um, so you need to make sure that you work with some other ones, particularly the ones on the official UCAT site, to make sure that you know about the other question formats as well. So if we have a look at the um, first question. This is probably the commonest type of abstract reasoning question. So what they do is they give you two sets of pictures. And what you have to do is to look at the six pictures in set A and try to find a rule which all those pictures adhere to, which is therefore the rule that governs membership of set A. And then find a different but related rule that governs membership of set B. And what you can then do is look at each test shape that they present you with and say, does that fit in set A, does it fit in set B, or does it not fit in either of them? So the challenge, obviously, is how on earth do you set about figuring out what the rules are? And this, the only way to do this is practice. Because to start with, you look at this and you think, well, you know, it could be anything. But actually, they have a sort of fairly limited repertoire of the kind of things they put into their rules. And so once you've practiced enough, you can effectively have a checklist of things to look for. Now, some people do that in a completely systematic way. They actually have a checklist and they go through it systematically in order. Other people will do it in a slightly more random way. And in the end, you have to decide what works best for you. But you have to have familiarity with loads of questions so that you begin to see what kinds of things to look for. So if we start with set A, you think, well, can we find something that all those pictures have in common? So sometimes it's to do with the numbers of shapes in the picture. But you can see there's nothing very obviously similar there. You've got three shapes in top left and then one and then three and then four. Is it to do with um, the numbers of white shapes compared to black shapes. But again, there's no obvious pattern similarity there. So it doesn't seem to do with, uh, to be to do with color. Is it to do with the color of the shape being related to the number of sides of the shape or what the shape is? But again, no, because you can see triangles are sometimes white, sometimes black. But these are all the kinds of things that you need to look for. Is it to do with the positions of the shapes? But again, there's nothing very obvious there. They look like they're fairly randomly distributed. Um, is it to do with just what shapes there are in the picture, regardless of, of how many there are, rather just particular recurring shapes? And that's where you finally hit on something. Because you can see in set A that you always have an equilateral triangle. You have a load of other stuff as well, but there is always an equilateral triangle. And what you should then be able to do 
is go to set B if you suspect that that's the rule, is then go to set B and find that there isn't an equilateral triangle in those shapes. And this, unfortunately, is where I think there is a flaw in this question. Because you can see that the picture bottom right has an equilateral triangle. And that's kind of annoying. That shouldn't happen because the answer to this question to, as to what the rules are is that all the shapes in set A have an equilateral triangle. And that should mean that the ones in set B don't. Um, and that one does. So that's a problem because it means when you have a test shape, if it has an equilateral triangle, there could be a situation where you wouldn't know which set it belonged to because set A all have an equilateral triangle, but set B sometimes do as well. So that's a flaw in the question. That shouldn't happen in an official UCAT question. So let's effectively ignore this one because it, it's, I think, a rogue picture that shouldn't really be there. If you look at the rest of the ones in set B, um, they don't have equilateral triangles. So I think the first part of the rule is shapes in set A have equilateral triangles, in set B don't. And as I say, we'll just treat this one as a rogue one. That won't be an issue in the official test. But there needs to be a rule for set B as well. It's not, it's very unlikely to be simply, oh, it doesn't have an equilateral triangle. It needs to have a positive thing. But it's likely to be related. So if set A is governed by positively having an equilateral triangle, set B is likely to be governed by positively having some other shape. So you look at what shape the pictures in set B have in common, and you can see they all have circles. So again, there's no particular pattern of the colour of those circles or the position or the size of those circles, but they all have a circle. So it seems like um, set A is going to be shapes that have a triangle. Shape set B is going to be shapes that have a circle. Um, but as I say, if you look at the individual pictures, this one could equally belong in set A for that, by that definition. And this one and this one both have a, an equilateral triangle and a circle. So they could equally belong in set B. And I think that's just a flaw in the question. So don't let that worry you. Um, just accept that they've messed up here, but that the rule you're going to go with is just if it has a triangle, you're going to put it in set A. If it has a circle, you're going to put it in set B. If it had both, you would be in trouble because you wouldn't know where it should go. And that's the problem of their question. So we're just going to assume that's not going to happen. If it has neither a triangle nor a circle, then it's going to be in neither set. So now that we know that's what the rule is, OK, if it's got a triangle, it goes in A. If it's got a circle, it goes in B. If it hasn't got either of them, it goes in the neither category, which is C. Now that you know that, you can do these questions really quickly. So although you don't have much time for this section, you can you know, afford a minute or more to try and figure out what the rule is, and then you can rattle through the test shapes. So let's see what we find then. So looking at this one, it has circles, doesn't have a triangle, so that suggests it's set B. OK, moving rapidly on to the next one. This one has no triangle, no circle, so it doesn't belong to either set. So that's fine. Next one um, has a equilateral triangle, which is here, doesn't have a circle, so that's set A. Next one has a circle, but no equilateral triangle. Um, so that fits squarely in set B. And this one 
has neither equilateral triangle nor circle, so that's a neither. Okay, so you can see once you've got the rule, it's really very fast. So this time, unfortunately, we've got a new set of pictures, so we're going to have to go back to the drawing board and find the new rules. Um, looking at these, you can see they look pretty irregular. This doesn't look like it's going to be to do with positions of objects and there's no shading. So it's going to be about counting. So the thing to do is to start counting things. So for the polygons, it's going to be the number of sides, probably. And for the blobs, it's just going to be how many of them are there. Um, so let's do that for at least some of them. You may not have time to do all of them if you're rushing, but at least you need to do enough of them to be convinced that there really is a pattern. So start with the simplest. So for set A, that's the simplest one. And just starting at the top corner, you can count one, two, three, four, five sides, four blobs. It's worth writing that, scribbling that down on your whiteboard. You know, five sides, four blobs, because that's going to help you to see the pattern later on. So now let's do another one. And you can see um, if we start here, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sides. Count the blobs and there are six. So seven sides, six blobs. And now, hopefully, just having scribbled those two things down, you can see a pattern, which is that there seems to be one more side than there are blobs. Um, so just getting it in two isn't enough, really, unless you're desperately rushing. So let's try it on um, another one. So if we do this much more complicated looking one top left, we can do that just to see. So if we start at this corner, We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 sides. Count the blobs and there are 12. So that's starting to look pretty compelling now. 13 sides, 12 blobs. So it seems to be that you always have one more side than you've got blobs. So we're going to suggest the rule is that the number of sides is equal to the blobs plus one. If that's the rule, there should be a related rule but obviously different, that defines set B. So we're going to be looking for the same kind of relationship here. So if we again start with a simple one, and you've got one, two, three, four sides there, and five blobs. So you can see the difference this time is that there's one more blob than there are sides. So the sides is equal to the blobs minus one, seems to be the case for that one. Let's see if that's true for another one. So if we do this one, uh, so let's write down what we got. It's important to write the numbers down in case uh, you forget what you saw or in case there's something else to be noticed, as we'll see in a minute. So four sides, five blobs for that one. If we come up to this one, start here, you get one, two, three, four, five, six sides. Count the blobs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you have six sides, seven blobs. So you can see this is uh, looking convincing that you've got one fewer side than you've got blobs. So you might think, right, great, I've got my rules. That's what they are. And then I can just quickly apply them to the test shapes. However, unfortunately, there's a bit more to it than that. And what you have to be aware of is that sometimes, not always, but sometimes the rules are more complicated than that. Sometimes you get two part rules where something like this has to be true, but something else has to be true as well. And because we've written the numbers down, you can perhaps spot quite quickly what that is, which is that if you look at the number of sides in set A, we had 13, 5, 7. They're all odd numbers. And if you do any more of them, again, they're all odd numbers. Whereas these two, we had six sides, four sides. If you look at any of the others, they're all even numbers. So that's the second part of the rule, that the number of sides is um, odd for this one, but the number of sides is even for this one. Now, getting those composite rules is really quite challenging um, when you're rushing. And we'll talk a bit later about what would have happened if you'd, for example, just got the first part of that rule and see that it's not a disaster. So 
um, you don't want to be too put off by this. A lot of people just having got that first part would say, right, that's my rule, I'm just going to go with that, and they end up doing fine. Um, so if you spot the extra dimension, that's brilliant, but don't worry too much if you don't. So let's see how that applies to our first test shape. So looking at this, we count the sides and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six sides. We count the blobs and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So straight away, that clearly doesn't fit either of them. It doesn't matter whether we've got the composite rule or not because it doesn't fit um, the first part. So that's definitely a neither at that point. So same rule here. Um, let's have a look at this shape. So if we start here and count the sides, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine sides. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine blobs. So again, they're equal. So it doesn't fit either of our numerical rules. So that is another neither, definitely. This one, if we start here, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six sides, five blobs. Okay, so you've got one more side than blob. So this time, um, that seems to fit set A. Okay, because sides is equal to um, blobs plus one, which was our rule for set A. But the question is, does it fit the other rule, which is that the um, number of sides needed to be um, odd? And you can see it doesn't. So the correct answer to that one is neither because in terms of the n plus one n minus one kind of rule it met the criterion for set a because there was one more side than there was than there were blobs but it didn't meet the criterion that the number of sides should be odd for set a so the answer is neither now that one obviously if you had only got the first part the sides is one more than the blobs you'd have got that one wrong but remember, you've already got two right. And that's the thing to cling to, that you don't have to get all of these right. If you get a decent percentage of them right, that's going to be enough. So it wouldn't be a disaster if you've got that one wrong. Let's look at this one. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten sides. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven blobs. Okay, so the number of blobs this time is one more than the number of sides. Okay, so sides is equal to blobs minus one. And that suggests that it could be set B. But again, we've got to say, yeah, but to be in set B, the um, number of sides needs to be even, but it is. So your B is correct because it meets both criteria for that one. So B is your answer. And again, you can see if you'd only got the fact that blobs was one more than sides, you'd have got that right anyway. So, so far you've only made one error if you only had half the rule. And that's the reassuring thing. Let's move on to the next one. And again, just Starting from here, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sides, and you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten blobs. So you've got one more blob than sides, which suggests set B, okay, because that's sides equals blobs minus one. But does it fit with the fact that set B? Um, requires you to have um, an even number of sides and the answer is no because you've got an odd number of sides okay so our rule for set B was that as well as having one more blobs than sides you had to have an even uh, sorry an odd number of blobs or an even number of sides and, and it doesn't fit that so the answer actually is neither now that one you would have got wrong if you had just based it on having one more blob than sides. 
So what that means is that overall, if you just had half of the rule, you would have got three out of five correct. And that's actually fine because many of these are easier than that. You're only going to get a few where you have complicated rules like that. So if you're getting something out of the ones with complicated rules because you got part of the rule and then you get other ones right because the rule was very simple and you spotted it, then there is no problem. But you can hopefully tell that you've got to really practice to get a feeling for what the rules are possibly could be um, and then to be very quick and efficient at um, writing down the rules and applying them. So this section is one that takes a great deal of practice. So we've summarised the issues here. Lots of practice. Be aware of the two-part rules, but don't worry too much about them. Um, you can't afford to spend ages looking for all the possible aspects of a rule. If you've spotted something that looks compelling, then it's probably um, worth moving straight on and applying it, unless you can do something very quickly to, to, to test what might be an extra aspect. So time-wise, you know, 55 questions in 14 minutes sounds terrifying. But remember that once you've established the rule, it's really quick to apply it to each individual picture. So th th those bold numbers are misleading. You know, you've got a decent amount of time to um, work out what the rule is, but then you have to make sure you're efficient in applying it to each pattern.